This is a very special day, um, Ordination Sunday. And an ordination is a church's affirmation of a young man in ministry. And we're going to explain more in the message today. And we have two candidates for ordination, Caleb Richardson, our discipleship pastor, Jacob Goff, our student pastor. We had a third on the schedule, Lucas Jackson, my son-in-law. Lucas is from this church, raised through the youth ministry, and serves as a student ministry pastor in Austin, Texas. And uh, family circumstances made it such that Lucas and Melissa, my daughter, were not able to be here today. And so we've put that on hold, that part of it, uh, those extenuating circumstances. But we're pleased for the opportunity today to honor Jacob and Caleb. And the message this morning is going to talk about ordination and the role that the church has and why we would undertake something like that as a church. Then tonight, we invite you back at 6 p.m. to be part of the ordination service. Uh, ordination is a very special time. It's only happened once in the history of First Baptist Church. And this church exists, has existed for over 150 years. It only happened one time back in 2005. And 2020 will be the second time this evening. So a very special occasion for us, and we'll explain even more about the why as we go along. I heard a story one time, and it sticks in the back of my mind a lot, about a church in Kentucky, and it was a small rural church that went through a series of pastors, and they didn't stay there very long, young pastors, but they would come there to that church as young men out of Bible college or seminary, and then they would leave for some humanly speaking, larger ministry, numerically larger. And this happened many times. And um, they would go on to significant ministries, if you will, ministries of notoriety. Significant, they're all significant in God's eyes. But humanly speaking, notoriety. And a guest to the church heard that story and was visiting with one of the members there. And the guest said to the member, Wow, it's too bad that that's happened. Think what this church could have been had one of those men stayed here. And the individual member of the church said, oh, that's not how we look at it at all. Think of what that says about us, that those men used to be here and went on to become what they became. And I think about that when it comes to this church because that church recognized their role in the development the growth and the encouragement of young men entering ministry. This church has had an impact on several young people going into ministry. You mentioned Lucas Jackson, and there's a young lady in Nepal, uh, Natalie Black, that we support and that grew up in this church and uh, serves there. And there's several others, and for this church to receive in uh, Jacob and Caleb, when they were right out of college, and to be supportive and encouraging. I think so often of when Terry and I moved here 25 and a half years ago. I was 32 years old, had never pastored before, and this congregation took a chance on a young family, young couple, and so many, it was about a year ago that I made a list of what I called the pioneers, the people that were here at the beginning of our time. And I wrote them a letter. I said, thank you so much for your support and encouragement. You have no idea what it means, and you don't. But I remember as we arrived, well, they, people drove from this church to Iowa to load up our belongings. I mean, 8 o'clock, Monday morning, August 15th, they are, there they are, uh, 1994. And there's these five people pull up and they're like loading things up. And then Jerry Cochran says, hey, I'll drive the truck. You ride with your family in the car. Because we know this is a big deal, a meaningful deal. And we arrive and there's all these people. They're just unloading and they're putting our sheets on the bed and hanging our curtains. And then they had a meal provided, uh, supper. Monday, August 15th. And Bill and Lena Dick hand us their phone number and stick it on the 
on our refrigerator before they walk out of the house. And I remember the night, the last Sunday night in July, when we accepted the call to ministry here. And I'm just a kid, completely intimidated by what we've just agreed to do here mutually. And Ed Wilson comes through the line and he shakes my hand and he says, I'm looking forward to submitting to your leadership. What? I'm a kid. Every week, a lady named Laura Lou Herman would come in and she'd pray for me in the office. And she'd say this. She'd say, Joe, I stuck up for you to the old people again. Over and over, she said that. I'm a young guy making mistakes, trying to change things, not thinking about how do you expand circles of communication and such. And so there was some heat generated. She said, I stuck up for you again, and she'd pray for me. And I began this morning again thinking as I was praying, and I just started writing down the pioneers people that were here 25 and a half years ago have continued the journey. I say all that to say, I don't know if you realize the significant role that you play in encouraging a pastor and in sustaining a pastor. Because when that criticism goes, see what happens when criticism happens is it might be five or seven. John Maxwell said the average pastor leaves a church because of seven people. But if you've been criticized by one or two, you don't think it's one or two. What do you start thinking? This is what everybody thinks. Everybody's against me. Nobody's in favor of this. And so when those individuals, those pioneers would come around and say, hey, maybe you could have done it a little differently or you communicated it differently, you could have worded it differently, but we're behind you. You have no idea what that means. And last August, when I stood here and said, this 25-year milestone has everything to do with a congregation that's patient, that overlooks when somebody doesn't measure up to their expectations, it says so much about who this body is. And I, I say all that because of how this congregation accepted and was patient with a young family, a young guy trying to figure out life and do ministry here. And you guys have done that on multiple occasions. Last Sunday, Chris Merrill stood here and said that he and Nancy arrived here when they were 21 years old. And this church loved them and accepted them and rallied around them and supported them and launched them toward the mission field with thousands of dollars raised. And it was almost, in May, it'll be 10 years when Caleb Richardson pulled in with an old Pontiac Bonneville piled to the ceiling. There's a snowboard on top and he arrives in Kansas. I was laughing like you are right now at what he had <laughs> just done. You're not in Michigan anymore, Caleb's what I was thinking. And he was so eager to get here, he moved here. Uh, I remember him saying he had finished school in December and he was working, looking for ministry and ma getting married in early June. And when can you start? As soon as you let me know, I can start. And he moved here by himself for three weeks and then left, went and got married, two-week honeymoon, and was back in two weeks. We're coming up on 10 years. And uh, I remember when Jacob, we uh, voted to call Jacob to come as our youth pastor, but he still had finals. So I was like, you better pass, Jacob, because we just voted. <laughs> and so finals go by, and I call him. Did you pass? Because we got a lot riding on this thing. <laughs> January 1st, we just passed five years for Jacob Goff to be here. And the role that this church plays, and we, when a pastor comes, we have expectations that they're going to 
minister and serve and lead. And rightly so. But I don't know if you realize sometimes the role that the church plays in support and encouragement. It doesn't mean you don't ask questions. Ask all the questions you want. But there's a huge difference between asking questions and having a questioning spirit. And I want to affirm this body. And when you think about the longevity of the staff here, I want you to look at it and say, this is a body that understands ministry, mutual ministry. And it's certainly not a topic that we get up and talk about all the time because how do I get up and say, hey, cheer me up, you know, once in a while. That's a little awkward. But this opportunity, I, I want to affirm this body for the kindness and generosity um, and the affirmation and encouragement and support that you extend. So let's dive into Scripture. If you have uh, your Bibles in 1 Peter chapter 5, we're going to go there in a moment. But I want to talk about the Bible and pastoral leadership to start. Then we're going to look into what the Bible specifically says on the subject of ordination. And then how do we evaluate a pastor when it comes to ordination? We're going to talk close on with that. So when we look at a local church and pastoral leadership, it's important to note that we're following the example and the teaching of Paul, the Apostle Paul in Scripture. Paul left us a model an example, and then he did a lot of teaching on having a pastor as a leader of church. For example, in Acts chapter 14, starting in verses 21 and following, starting in verse 21 of Acts 14, when they, Paul and Barnabas, had preached the gospel to that city, and they made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium, and Antioch. So Paul and his team, they've started churches and they're returning to these different churches. Verse 22, we'll go to the next verse. And it says there, they were strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. So they're discipling believers. And that verse 22 would be a model of what pastoral discipleship looks like, where you're Strengthening the souls of believers. Helping them understand that even as a Christian, we're going to go through many trials and sufferings and difficulties. Continue in the faith. And then verse 23, take a look at that one. It says in verse 23, when they had appointed elders in every church and they prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. That word appointed in the uh, Old King James, is ordained, and it means this, to designate with the hand. To designate with the hand. Later on in the message, and tonight we'll talk about, there's the imagery in the New Testament of laying on of hands and <clears throat> praying over the individual to designate them, appoint them, affirm them. So there was that example. And then in Titus chapter 1, Verse 5, Paul's giving instructions to Titus. And many of our references today, I will say this, will be drawn from First and 2 Timothy and Titus. They're known as the pastoral letters, the pastoral epistles. And so for a church to understand what to look for in a pastor, for pastors to understand what leadership is about serving in a church, those three books were written by Paul to pastors Timothy and Titus. And so look what it says in Titus chapter 1 and verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order the things that are lacking. So there's going to be some teaching and organizing that Titus needs to do. And appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. So that appoint is, again, the word and idea of ordain. Now what follows in Titus 1 
uh, verse 6 is a list of qualifications that a pastor needs to meet. And so it's a significant list there that pastors are to strive for or aspire to. So it follows the example and teaching of Paul. Not only that, but we think of the church and pastoral leadership. It's a position of both humility and honor. It's a position of humility and honor. It's a position of humility because, quite honestly, I can't believe God would use any of us. I say that the church is a mix of the human and the divine. And it's a wonder, given the humanity of the leadership, given the humanity of the rest of us, it's a wonder that the divine comes through at all. But when the divine shines through, it's in spite of. Well, I think of 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 7 a lot. It says there, we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the excellency is of God and not of us. So that the excellency is of the power. So that it's obvious it's God at work. <laughs> what he's saying is there, if something good happens, it's clearly God at work and it's not those people that are in leadership positions. And that's humbling. Why God chooses to bless and when God chooses to bless, don't always understand that. God's timing, God's way. And as a pastor, I understand my inability to change somebody's heart or to speak to every need. It's an overwhelming feeling, quite honestly, on Sunday mornings to think there will be people in the room and I don't know what their needs are. God, the Holy Spirit, you've got to speak to every heart. And only you, God, can change a heart. I don't want to go through the motions here. We're not just trying to put in our time. We want to see God radically transform lives. That can't happen from persuasive words. That only happens through the power of God. And that's humbling to know that if anything good gets accomplished, it's God doing it. But it's also an honor because in a pastoral role, I get to have a front seat to the work of God in so many lives, in so many places, and get to walk with people through the highs and lows of life. And that's an honor. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1, it says there, um, this is a faithful saying that if anyone desires the position of a bishop, a pastor, an overseer. He desires a good thing. It's a place of honor. It's a position of honor. And uh, a third observation, and this is where we're going to go to 1 Peter chapter 5. The Bible provides job descriptions, not titles. Job descriptions and not titles. Let me show you what I mean by that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. I'll read 1 through 4 if you want to follow along. The elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. There's three words in this text that refer to the same church office. And we sometimes, maybe from other churches, you hear about their uh, leaders of the church have this title or this label. And sometimes we wonder, you know, what's the right thing that we should call church leaders in the right way to organize church leadership and such. So I want you to notice three words in this text that refer to the same church office, but they, they're job descriptions. They're not titles. For example, the word shepherd is there or pastor. In verse 2, he says, shepherd the flock of God. You might underline or circle the, these three words. And the word shepherd or pastor refers to Caring, feeding, and leading. 
one who tends the flock. We think of Moses was a shepherd before he led the children of Israel out of Egypt. David was a shepherd before he was the king um, over Israel. The second word is elder. Elder. And it means, it has the idea of spiritual maturity. Hopefully there's an accumulating wisdom that's taking place. <clears throat> and so uh, the third word is bishop or overseer. Serving as overseers, it says in verse 2. The word overseer means administrating, managing, supervising. So we have three words here, shepherd or pastor, bishop overseer or elder, and they're used interchangeably. Because he's referring to the same individuals here. The elders who are there shepherd well, serving as overseers. So it's interchangeable, and, and what it's giving us then is a job description. It's not giving us a title, it's giving job descriptions. I prefer the pa uh, pastor idea, I guess, because it, it, the caring, feeding, and leading. I love that dimension of the job description. But what about then this local church? What about ordination? What are the implications, and where do we draw from Scripture? Well, first of all, the local church has an authority about it that is a, an independent authority, the local church and its authority. <clears throat> God gives local churches, within their authority structure, within their authority, a leadership structure to make independent decisions. Decisions dependent on God, very dependent on God. Christ is the head of the church in that. But it, there's not some hierarchy of headquarters that we would check in with. We look within our church. We have leadership teams selected uh, that the congregation selects. And we say, what decisions should we make? What direction should we go? And in this case, who should we ordain? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, there's a fascinating phrase there. Jesus had said prior to that, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ. And so then verse 18, Jesus said, I say to you that you are Peter, a stone, but on this rock, I, the truth that you are the Christ, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now we've taken that phrase, I will build my church, and we've asked and we've said, did God mean us when he said that? And we've concluded, absolutely, he meant us. But look at the next verse, because I, I wanted you to see the context was church. Look at the next scripture verse, verse 19. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's kind of an odd scripture. What God was saying, what Jesus was speaking to his disciples, and he said, when you establish a local church on Bible principles, there is an authority within that church, in this case, to ordain leaders. The same thing happened in Matthew chapter 18. You're maybe familiar with the scripture where two or, people are gathered, two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. This verse 18 is the same context. Matthew 18 and verse 18. Jesus says the same thing. Assuredly, I say to you that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus said, God gives an authority to a local church to make certain kinds of decisions. The New Testament speaks of... Uh, a discipline process where if there was some member of the church living in a gross negligent sin and they were defiant about it and the church was celebrating that sin, how does the church deal with that? Or if there's a terribly divisive member of the church that's causing the church to be divided and uh, they're promoting false doctrine and division. The Bible explains a, an authority that the local church has for a church discipline. Thankfully, that's not something that we've had to talk about or think about here. 
local church authority. I wanted to establish that. It's not something, this ordination idea is not something that a Bible college does or a seminary confers. It's a local church authority issue. Secondly, there's local church affirmation. I want to say that. There's times when a local church sets apart individuals and teams. Uh, every time a mission team leaves from our congregation, we have them come to the front and we offer prayer for them to launch them out with the blessing and affirmation of this congregation. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 2, uh, it describes a sending out from the church at Antioch. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And then verse 3 goes on and it says, then having fasted and prayed, they sent them away. There was this local church affirmation. Jesus had a lot of followers, but he selected and appointed 12. In Mark chapter 3 and verse 14, we have um, Jesus appointing 12 of the many. Then he appointed 12 that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Those two key words, with. Be with him and then send out. Uh, that word appointed, by the way, in the, is the same idea of ordain, to designate with the hand. And so it's a local church issue and what a local church does, and that's why we're thrilled to do that. So let me make application for us, local church application. The Bible does not say how to do it. It doesn't say follow this procedure and this procedure and this procedure. It just says do it. It says ordain elders, ordain pastors. This is not something that the individual suggests. The person to be ordained doesn't say, hey, I'd like to be ordained. I, would, I want the church to ordain me. That's not what happens. It's the church itself that decides this is what we would want to do. We see in this individual, we wish to affirm them and ordain them. A third um, observation when it comes to applying this is that the ordination is to be a man. It's to be a man. Uh, 1 Timothy 3, again, verse 1. It says, uh, if a, uh, this is a faithful saying, if a man desires the position of a bishop, he desires a good thing. Look at verse 2. It goes on to list a series of qualifications. A bishop then must be blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, and apt to teach. The clear teaching and example of Scripture is that pastors are men. Now, there's many examples of prominent women in servant leadership roles throughout Scripture but the role of pastor is reserved for a man. We think of the order of creation and the teaching of Scripture. Now, in the Scriptures, a man's leadership role is defined as within the family and within the church, but nowhere else in society. There's not anywhere in the Bible that prohibits leadership, headship in business or in government or in uh, the White House, or wherever. That's, the Bible speaks, when it speaks, it's addressing a family, and it's addressing the local church. Now, there's some controversy in our day and, uh, about the ordin, ordin, ordaining women, the ordination of women. And some churches have what they call the egalitarian view that men and women and their roles are equal. There's others, and I would hold to the biblical complementarian view, that the roles are different and complete each other. They complement each other. They're not equal. They're different. And um, complementarian role when it comes to pastor level and home level. Uh, one more on this local church and ordination. Let a man prove himself is a phrase. Ordination isn't something that's done at the beginning of someone's ministry. There's some time of validation 
and observation that takes place. In chapter 5 of 1 Timothy, verse 22, it says, Do not lay hands suddenly on no one. It doesn't mean don't lose your cool and slug somebody. It's talking about that prayer of affirmation, of appointing, of designating with the hand. And it's saying, don't get in a hurry. It's not something that's done in the early days of ministry. Now it happened, it's not something, I don't think we need to wait 20, 30 years. I think we're at the right stage with the individuals that we have involved. So ordination does not confer more authority on somebody. It does not confer more power on somebody. It adds support and affirmation to individuals. And it's an opportunity for the church to say, we have a role in growing and developing young leaders. Let's recognize that role and do everything that we can to affirm that role. So how do we evaluate that? Let me offer four ways that we would consider evaluating an individual when it comes to ordination. The first is calling, calling. When we're interviewing somebody to come and uh, consider being a pastor on staff, we would ask them, has God called you to ministry? Have you sensed an awareness that God wants you to do this and you can't do anything else? And so the individual might tell us that they've been called by God. But this evaluation, this sense of calling is from the outside in. Do other people recognize, does the local church recognize God's hand is on this individual? They clearly have a passion and a desire and a drive from God. Ordination is a church saying, we see God's hand on your life. We want to ordain you to gospel ministry. The second is character. Character. There's two scriptures. Tonight, uh, there will be a, a folder of sorts, a guide for order of service and such. And on the back, we're listing 1 Timothy 3, the qualifications for a pastor, and Titus chapter 1, the qualifications for a pastor. Now, nobody's perfect, and none of us have arrived. We're in the process. But they list out for us characteristics to aspire to, to seek after, to look for in evaluating those in ministry. 1 Timothy 3, one of them speaks of those who are, have a good reputation. And so character is something that we're looking for and examining. A third one is convictions. Doctrinal beliefs. What are their convictions about the Word of God? Each of our ordination candidates have prepared a doctrinal statement. Here's what I believe about Jesus Christ and God the Creator and the Holy Spirit and how does somebody get saved and whether you keep your salvation or not. And a whole list of topics that they thought were relevant. Here are the key doctrinal beliefs. The deacons are serving as the selected leaders of the church, the leadership body. They're serving in the role of the ordination council. And this afternoon at 4 p.m., uh, our two candidates will get called in one at a time for 45 minutes of intensive grilling over their doctrinal statements. My thought is we've spent the last five to ten years understanding and hearing them teach and preach we have a pretty good idea of what their doctrine is going to be. But we're going to ask them questions to clarify and such um, what their convictions are. Jude chapter 1 and verse 3 speaks about convictions. While I was diligent to write to you concerning uh, our common salvation, I found it necessary to exhort you to earnestly contend for the faith that body of truth which was once delivered to the saints. Are you fighting for the truth of Scripture? Are you adhering to that? Are you erring on the side of, here's what the Bible says? 
And that's part of what they were working on over the last few months. Uh, the deacons have been evaluating and reading those doctrinal statements. And uh, then we are going to get to ask some questions uh, this afternoon. The fourth one, the last one that we're evaluating them based on, is their competence. Do they have some skills and abilities? Is there some leadership talent that we recognize? Are they growing in learning leadership? It doesn't mean that they're natural leaders. Are they growing in learning leadership? Are they communicators that can communicate the gospel? Are they able to perform the duties of gospel ministry? Can he or she, can he lead or communicate and relate the gospel to people. So today at four, the ordination council is going to meet one at a time for 45 minutes with each of the candidates. Then at 6 p.m. is the ordination service, and we invite you to be here for that. <clears throat> we'll hear there will be somebody from the ordination council that will make a recommendation to the congregation that these individuals be ordained. And then someone from the congregation will speak on their behalf. We'll hear a few words from each of their wives um, and what they observe and their um, affirmation of their spouses. And then it concludes with the laying on of hands where the ordination council affirms and sets apart for gospel ministry in a significant way these two individuals. After that's finished, well, we're going to have a nice cake and celebrate and have a congratulations time. So we invite you to stay. Uh, come back tonight and then be part of all of that as a way to ordain and affirm uh, based on a pattern or example that is left for us in Scripture. I want you to be encouraged, or maybe you haven't even thought about it before, the role that the congregation plays in growing and forming and shaping and fueling young men in ministry, young people in ministry. It brought us to this point today and then to be a part of it today and tonight. Would you stand with us, please? Would you bow with me in prayer? God in heaven, you've provided in scripture some guidelines for the orderly arrangement and organization and function of a church. And to think that we can be part of your process of raising up young leaders God the the honor of watching you work in people's lives and having a front row seat to that so humbling I thank you for the many people, God, that are encouraging, that have contributed to these young men. And God, may this body of people create such a healthy environment that young people by the dozens are raised up to enter into ministry and represent you all over the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.